You are invited to participate in a true multimedia experience coming to a home near you. LCM TV is bringing Lake County into the new millennium with news, live broadcast, information, music, talk shows, and local programming. All streaming in high definition online and soon to be on your Roku box. Join us at lcm-tv.com or be a part of our studio audience. You can also watch the shows at lakecomagazine.com as we provide programming to inform, enlighten, and maybe even enrage you. On Lake County Magazine Talk Show with Terry and Pete the Tax Guy, Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Like racing? Try the Checkered Flag Show, hosted by Ace Naylor, on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. All ages and divisions in regional and national fields. Joni Lane brings a positive light to you every Monday at 3 p.m. Pasha Space brings an international flair as they discuss ecological, health, and social issues in Haiti with people around the world. End up your week with positive, conscious sounds on Saturday at 9 a.m. with Sister T on the bridge. This show is also simulcast on KMEC 105.1 FM in Ukiah. Our latest show, LCM TV News, is brought to you live Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at noon and rebroadcast at 6.30 p.m. and noon daily, Tuesdays, Saturday, and Sunday, featuring national, regional, and local news, weather, and sports. We have it all here for you on your local TV station, LCM TV. Join us online and soon on Roku, giving you access to all the best Lake County has to offer. We are LCMTV.com, your multimedia connection. Tune in for the fun. It's live TV at its best. Hey, good afternoon, folks. This is LCM TV News at Noon. We're not your normal news. I'm Pete Schiffman. And I'm Amanda Gonzalez. And thank you for joining us today on this beautiful, sunny, and hot day. In a lead story today, the Supreme Court blocked one of the Obama administration's most ambitious environmental initiatives, one meant to limit emissions of mercury and other toxic pollutants from coal-fired power plants this morning. Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion in a 5-4 decision, joined by the court's more conservative members. Industry groups in some 20 states challenged the Environmental Protection Agency's decision to regulate the emissions, saying the agency had failed to take into account the punishing costs its regulations would impose. The Clean Air Act required the regulations to be appropriate and necessary. Challenges said the agency had run afoul of that law by deciding to regulate the emissions without first undertaking a cost-benefit analysis. The agency responded that it was not required to take costs into account when it made the initial determination to regulate. But the agency added that it did not, that it did not so later in setting emission it, it standards so and that in any event the benefits far outweighed the cost. The two sides had very different understandings of the costs and benefits involved. Industry groups said the government had imposed annual costs of $9.6 billion to achieve about $6 million in benefits. The agency said the costs yielded tens of billions of dollars in benefits. This morning's decision reversed one of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, which ruled that the agency's interpretation of the Clean Air Act was reasonable. In dissent, Judge Kavanaugh said that, in context, the statute required attention to costs as a matter of common sense common parlance, and common practice. In our next story, David Sweat, the remaining prison escapee on the run in northern New York, was shot by a state trooper and taken into custody on Sunday after a 23-day manhunt that began with an improbable escape from two maximum security cells and ended in the rain-drenched woods just south of the Canadian border. Sweat, 35, a murderer who had been serving a sentence of life without parole, was in stable condition. The shooting occurred around 3.20 p.m. after state police sergeant spotted a man jogging down a road, stopped to question him, and recognized him as Sweat. He told Sweat to come over to him, but instead he turned and fled a field toward the tree line. Sergeant Jay Cook, a firearms instructor who was patrolling by himself, gave chase and finally opened fire, striking Sweat twice in the torso, because he realized the fugitive was going to make it into the woods and possibly disappear from them. More than 1,300 officers in range slick gear helped to tighten a cordon around Sweat on Sunday as the search, which had at times appeared to lurch between New York towns, focused in on 22 square miles of rugged terrain. The confrontation with Sweat took place two days after his partner in flight from the authorities, Richard Matt, 
were shot and killed by a federal agent in the woods of Malone, New York. Twit had been serving a sentence of life without parole for the July 4, 2002 killing of a Broome County Sheriff's deputy after he came upon Sweat and two friends after robbing a fireworks and firearms store in Pennsylvania. Sweat shot him multiple times. While the duty was still, deputy was still alive, Sweat ran over him in his car. Also, a small plane crashed into a house Sunday evening, killing three people on board, but residents managed to flee as fire engulfed the home. A beach craft BE-36 aircraft crashed into the house about 5.45 p.m. Sunday. It had taken off from Lancaster Airport in Pennsylvania and was headed to Norwood Memorial Airport in Massachusetts. Fire crews extinguished the blaze nearly three hours after the crash in Plainville, about 30 miles southwest of Boston. Residents escaped and preliminary reports show three people in the plane were killed. The plane wound up behind a two-story colonial where section of the tail and charged wing rested on a hillside in the yard. Neighbors reported hearing something amiss as the plane flew over their homes. The engine sounded like it was sputtering and they heard a crash and saw smoke. The NTSB is expected to arrive at the crash site today. The identities of the dead won't be released until the NTSB notified their families. Hundreds of people were injured at a water park in Taiwan on Saturday when a cloud of colored powder ignited in the air over a crowd during an event, erupting into a huge fireball. No deaths were reported, but at least 516 people were injured, 194 seriously, including eight with life-threatening injuries. The injured, many suffering burns, were in their young 20s or younger. Video taken of the scene showed the flames erupting within the crowd at the event, called Color Play Asia, about 8.30 p.m. People were shown carrying the injured from the scene in inflatable rafts, and others were shown running away, silhouetted by flames. The fire was quickly controlled, but not before hundreds were hurt. Taiwan's Ministry of Health and Welfare said the Taipei area hospitals had many victims requiring skin grafts. The ministry said hospitals were also urgently requesting other medical supplies needed to treat burns. The victims were mostly from Taiwan, with only four people from mainland China and two citizens of other countries. They were being treated at 38 hospitals in the Taipei area. One 18-year-old woman who was not identified suffered burns on 90% of her body. Taiwan's pr Prime Minister, Chi Kao, told reporters on Sunday that public events using airborne colored paint powder would be banned and that the government would set up a group to deal with the treatment and rehabilitation of people who were injured. The person at the park responsible for events, as well as two other employees, have been taken to a nearby police station for questioning. The police may charge several employees with negligence and public endangerment. The cause of the explosion is still under investigation. The powder that Color Play Asia uses is made of cornstarch and food coloring. The manufacturers added that to its products were in line with standards set by SGS, which is a Geneva-based testing, inspection, and verification company. No one at the company was available over the weekend to comment on whether Color Play Asia's products did get SGS certification and whether the process also, excuse me, also includes tests for flammability. Puerto Rico's governor saying he needs to pull out the island of a death spiral. He has concluded that the Commonwealth cannot pay its roughly $72 billion in debts, an admission that will probably have wide-reaching financial repercussions. The governor, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, and senior members of his staff said in an interview last week that they would probably seek significant concessions from as many as all of the island's creditors. Garcia Padilla said that debt is not payable and there is no other option. A broad reconstructing, restructuring sorry, by Puerto Rico sets the stage for an unprecedented test of the United States municipal bond market which cities and states rely on to pay for most of their basic needs, like road construction and public hospitals. That market has already been shaken by municipal bankruptcies in Detroit, Stockton, and elsewhere, which undercuts assumptions that local governments in the U.S. would always pay back their debt. Puerto Rico, as a commonwealth, does not have the option of bankruptcy. A default on its debts would most likely leave the island and its creditors and its residents in a legal and financial limbo that, like the debt crisis in Greece, could take years to sort out. 
Garcia Bedelia said that his government could not continue to borrow money to address budget deficients while asking its residents already struggling with high rates of poverty and crime to shoulder most of the burden tax through increases and pension cuts. Greece will keep its banks closed on Monday and place restrictions on the withdrawal and transfer of money, Prime Minister Alex Cyprus said in a televised address on Sunday night as Athens tried to avert a financial collapse. The government's decision to close banks temporarily and impose other so-called capital controls and to keep the stock market closed on Monday came hours after the European Central Bank said it would not expand an emergency loan program that had been propping up Greek banks in recent weeks while the government was trying to reach a new debt deal with international creditors. The debt negotiations broke down over the weekend as Cyprus said he would not let the Greek people decide whether to accept the creditors' latest offer. That referendum vote is to be held next Sunday, after the current bailout program will have expired. Cyprus, in his televised address, criticized Eurozone finance ministers for refusing to extend Greece's loan program, a decision that in turn prompted that the European Central Bank to decline to increase its emergency loans to Greek banks. Cyprus' remarks did not include details of the bank closings and other controls on the movement of money, which the government was expected to explain later in the evening. Greece, though, appears to be taking steps similar to ones by Cyprus in 2013 to avoid a bank collapse. Greece's own central banker, Yanis Stournaris, said in a statement after the European Central Bank's decision on Sunday that the Greek central bank would take all measures necessary to ensure financial stability for Greek citizens in these difficult circumstances. A solar-powered plane attempting to circumnavigate the globe without fuel took off from Japan early Monday after an unscheduled month-long stop. The Solar Impulse 2 departed around 3 a.m. from an airport in Nagoya in central Japan. The plane with one pilot is attempting a 120-hour flight to Hawaii, the longest leg of its journey so far. The plane requires the right weather conditions and organizers were withholding an official announcement of the takeoff until they are sure the flight can continue. A formal message will be issued once Solar Impulse has passed the point of no return and that we know that the pilot Andre Borschberg, sorry, Borschberg is on a safe track to reach Hawaii. The press team said in an email to journalists, the Solar Impulse originally left Nanjing, China for Hawaii, but diverted to Japan on June 1st because of unfavorable weather ahead. It has been waiting for the right conditions to depart. The flight over the Pacific to Hawaii is risky because there is no place to land in an emergency. The solar impulse is too powered by more than 17,000 solar cells on its wings that recharge its batteries, enabling it to fly. The project is meant to de demonstrate the potential of improved energy efficiency and clean power. Through solar-powered air, travel is not yet commercially practical. And another story that's right up my alley. The Internal Revenue Service once again is not practicing what they preach. Officials broke their own rules by handling, handing out dozens of contracts worth more than $18 million to companies with federal tax debt. The Watchdog Review found 17 corporations, each of them had racked up thousands of dollars in tax debts, won 57 contracts from the IRS between 2012 and 2013, in violation of the 2012 law against this practice. A major cause of abuse lies in the fact that contractors are permitted to self-certify whether they have tax debts or felony convictions with less ex expectations that the IRS will verify their statements. The latest Inspector General report builds up its previous work on this issue, a report in 2013 which the IRS simply ignored. It demonstrates how little progress the agency has made to keep tax cheats and felons from becoming federal contractors. The 2013 report discovered 7% of the agency's vendors had accumulated $589 million worth of tax debt. Oh my goodness. But the problem went uncorrected. What a shock. The IRS's response to this latest report was to say essentially, uh, mm, uh, uh, well, we'll get to it, uh, maybe tomorrow. These sort of laughs has only served to deepen the agency's credibility problems with the taxpayers who don't get off so easy when the IRS comes after them for tax violations, Page said. And the Inspector General report offers only a glimpse of a much bigger problem, rampant all over the government. 
the contract procurement system is broken and bad actors continue to be able to obtain federal contracts with impunity. Oh, I get it. <laughs> IRS. The CHP continues to investigate a hit and run collision on Sunday that left a motorcyclist with major injuries in Napa. They said the rider was traveling northbound on Highway 121 or Monticello Road north of Vicki Avenue around 5.40 p.m. Saturday when a Dodge Charger coming in the opposite direction crossed over the double yellow lines hitting the 1996 BMW motorcycle. The motorcycle rider identified as Harry George Burroughs, 54 of Moraga, was taken to Queen of the Valley Hospital. The female driver of the Dodge Charger, who was alone in the car, fled the scene on foot, according to authorities. A CHP spokesman on Sunday said Burroughs remained in the hospital with major injuries. More than 86,500 marijuana plants were seized last week during a four-day eradication operation in the heart of Northern California's Emerald Triangle, where law enforcement officials from three counties also reported finding egregious, egregious excuse me, folks, environmental violations. The plants, along with cash, firearm, and thousands of pounds of dried pot were confiscated from the remote island mountain region where Mendocino, Humboldt, and Trinity counties meet. Some 30 to 40 people, mostly law enforcement officers from the three county sheriff's departments, assisted by Fish and Wildlife and a handful of National Guard officers, participated in the assault on what they say were obviously illegal growing operations, most of which included more than a thousand plants each. Mendocino County Sheriff's Tom Allman said Friday it was amongst the largest pot eradication operations since the six county action in 2011, dubbed Operation Full Court Press that removed some 630,000 plants from the Mendocino National Forest. This is one of the largest we've had, he said. According to Ullman, the entire area composed of parcels ranging in size from 40 acres to 106. Sorry. 160. Yeah, 160 acres. That is a lot. Yes, it is. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh. Anyway, from 40 acres to 160 acres contain one of the highest concentrations of illegal gardens in the three-county region. Four people were arrested during the operation, including three in Mendocino County and one in Trinity County. In most cases, the growers took off before law enforcement officers arrived. It is suspected they've been tipped off by radio reports. Investigations into the gardens are continuing and further arrests are likely. Law enforcement officers found egregious environmental issues. Fish and Wildlife Lieutenant Chris Stutz said his department's team found 97 environmental violations 55 of them related to stream bed alterations. Creeks have been dammed, filled in with dirt, and diverted in order to make way for and provide water for the plants, which have been conservatively estimated to each use about six gallons of water a day. Investigators found large water tanks at several locations, and in one case, a gigantic bladder used by marijuana farmer to store water. There also were cases of unlawful grading on a large scale, with half-acre pads being bulldozed for cultivation, Stutz said. He said water in the nearby fork of the Eel River was hardly flowing and was full of algae, likely generated by runoff from fertilizer. There's a broad spectrum of environmental damage there, he said. The raids came out of time when growers, state regulators, and law enforcement leaders are trying to work together to hammer out rules in anticipation that Californians may follow other states and legalize marijuana for recreational use. We need them to be partners and collaborators in creating regulations that has, uh, Hezekiah Allen, executive director of the Emerald Growers Association, an advocacy group for medical marijuana farmers, business owners, and patients. The raids are the absolute opposite of that, Allen said. Ullman said the growers are well aware of current regulations and that they need to follow them until they change. The laws have not changed yet, he said. Marijuana advocates in Humboldt and Mendocino counties have said they don't want to have personal knowledge of the pot farms targeted in the raids, but they believe most were probably what they would consider small farms, because they were growing smallish plants in a manner that gradually deprives the plants of light to fold them into flowing early. Allen said those plants produced between an ounce and a quarter pound of dried marijuana, rather than the two to four pounds from larger plants. Allen is listed as an owner of one of the parcels that was raided this week, but he said he's not involved in growing pot and has previously attempted to remove his name from the deed. A thousand of those plants is a small farm, Allen said. 
He said the smaller plants also use less water than tree-sized ones, in part because they have a shorter growing season. Almond said the smaller plants can produce two to three pounds of processed pot. Of the plants confiscated, 45,553 were in Mendocino County, 23,211 were in Humboldt County, and 17,725 were in Trinity County. Humboldt County officials said the pot eradications they conducted were average for their department. Mendocino County served nine search warrants during the eradication operation. Humboldt served seven, and Trinity served four, the sheriff said. Last summer and fall, the state's 59-day campaign against marijuana planting, better known as CAMP, seized 66,818 pot plants from Mendocino County, 37,455 from Humboldt County, and 90,283 from Trinity County. The figures do not plants seized by local agencies without the state assistance the rest of the year. Statewide camp confiscated 833,966 plants last year, down from the 939,722 eradicated in 2013, and less than a quarter of the 4.5 million seized in 2009, according to camp statistics. Ullman said he and the other sheriffs plan to revisit Island Mountain in the fall and crack down on those who continue to flout the law. I have every reason to believe the growers will continue, he said. The political action group California Cannabis Voice Humboldt, also known as CCVH, has worked hard to legitimize the industry, drafting legislation, packing the board of supervisors, chambers, and urging farmers to come out of the shadows and be regulated. So when law enforcement raided grow operations on Island Mountain last week, including at least one belonging to a member of the group, activists viewed it as a betrayal of their trust. The identity of the growers and or property owners targeted in the raids have yet to be disclosed, nor have the conditions of the grow operations. CCVH Executive Richard, Director Richard Marks suggested that the grow connected to a CCVH member was being operated responsibly, though law enforcement said they were just doing what they have always done, going after large-scale commercial cultivators suspected of water diversion, environmental degradation, or other criminal activity. Regardless of this apparent rift between growers and authorities, CCVH is forging ahead with plans to unveil its latest draft of a land use ordinance aimed at regulating outdoor marijuana cultivation. The group announced at its latest newsletter that the draft ordinance will be unveiled at rally at a rally on the Humboldt County Courthouse steps Tuesday at 3 p.m. Since the raids began Monday, growers and their advocates have taken to a social media to voice their indignation. With several uniting behind the hashtag, Stand with Farmers, Southern Humboldt cannabis activist and grower Casey O'Neill wrote a defiant manifesto on Facebook declaring we will fight this battle in the halls of power until we stand victorious. O'Neill, whose farm has recently filmed by documentary producers with HBO's Vice News, went on, we will not be blamed, bowed, scapegoated, or otherwise treated with anything but honor and accord we deserve as farmers. In a report yesterday on KMUD News, an environmental engineer told reporter Carrie Reynolds that this week's raids were a setback for growers who had been actively working to make their operations more environmentally friendly. The engineer said that a client of his employer was among the targets of the raids, despite the fact that the client had recently invested in several permits and environmental improvements, including rainwater catchment storage tanks. The raids might have something to do with federal attorneys' general enforcement guidelines in states where medical marijuana is legal. Those guidelines call for an enforcement whenever there's evidence of cultivation for commercial sale or distribution, sales to minors, environmental destruction, or organized crime. Among other items on a checklist of red flags, CCVH still hopes to get a countrywide outdoor cultivation, countywide outdoor cultivation ordinance on the books before the year's out. Two fires that erupted within 45 minutes of each other in the remote Mendocino County community of Covalo burned at least four structures Sunday afternoon, including one residence. According to the Mendocino County Sheriff's Department, the blazes were started by mowers and did not appear suspicious. We had two fires, one was about five acres and another about 30 acres, said Bob 
Farias, Cal Fire Division Chief in the Mendocino County Unit. He was unable to confirm the cause of the fires, but said the largest blaze began about 1 p.m. on the south end of town. The second was reported at 1.42 p.m. on the north end of town. The Sheriff's Department reported that three outbuildings and one residence were destroyed with no injuries. Multiple air tankers, a helicopter, air attack plane, two hand crews, 13 fire engines, and two battalion chiefs were on hand from Cal Fire. Other fire agencies came from Laytonville, Little Lake, Hoplin, Brook Trails, Redwood Coast, and Kofalo. Kosovo. Kofalo, sorry folks. <laughs> Containment of both fires were achieved last night. The song still ran along to the uninitiated, the communal, the communal rituals of the faithful fans probably looked strange. Well, this was a Grateful Dead show. After all, all the first in a handful over the next week that are said to be the last, the four surviving members of the dead, joined by a trio of well-versed companions, launched their Fare Thee Well mini-tour Saturday night in Northern California, where the, le where the legendary jam band got its start 50 years ago, and almost two decades after the death of beloved lead guitarist Jerry Garcia, during a performance that featured a little more than three and a half hours of music, the group's so-called Core Four rhythm guitarist Bob Ware, bassist Phil Lesh, and percussionist Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzmann, Kreutzmann unreeled a set list featuring both crowd pleasers and obscure pieces from their early catalog. The band got the Levi Stadium crowd of about 80,000 into its customary loose-limbed groove at the start with familiar renditions of Truckin' and Uncle John's band. From there, the rest of the first set veered unevenly through Cumberland Blues, Born Cross-Eyed, and 20-minute long Walla Lee Blues. As Viola Lee was ending, a rainbow arced across the sky above the stadium like a smile from, be from beyond. The majority of the audience, which included former flower children with more than a touch of gray in their hair, as well as millennials who were babies when Garcia died, were inclined to appreciate every chord, so grateful they were just to be there. The Grateful Dead are scheduled to play a second show in Santa Clara on Sunday before heading to Chicago for three shows at Soldier Field on July 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Soldier Field is where they last played as a group before Garcia's death at age 53. Although the original band members say July 5th will be the last time they perform together, they all have their own bands or musical projects and have teamed up as pairs for select gigs. I guess you're a little bit too young to be a deadhead or a flower child. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, our well, executive... you got the gray hair for it. <laughs> On the other hand, folks, my wife and executive director here was a flower child. Was? Is. <laughs> Still. Okay. Litigation of the May 19th Plains All-American Pipeline spill off the, excuse me, folks, Gaviota Coast gained a powerful combatant on June 24th when former Santa Barbara City Attorney Barry Capilla said he filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of 3,000 property owners from Point Conception to the Mexican border. Capelo's lawsuit came as tar balls that resulted from the spill were found on beaches in Ventura and Los Angeles counties. Capelo asked city attorneys to sue the oil companies responsible for the 1969 oil spill off Santa Barbara's coast, and he more recently sued Santa Barbara on behalf of the minority residents ending the at-large voting system in favor of districts. The lawsuit alleges that Plains 24-inch wide pipeline lacked an automatic shutoff system that would have prevented such a large oil spill from occurring. When the pipeline was built in 1987, according to the lawsuit, Santa Barbara County demanded that a shutoff system be installed and the county inspect the wells on the pipelines. Instead, the defendant sued, arguing that the county lacked the authority to force it to install an automatic shutoff system or to inspect its pipeline. This was no accident, said Capolo, in a statement. This was a total disregard of safety measures on the part of planes. Federal agencies have cited planes for at least 175 safety and maintenance violations since 2006. It's paid millions of dollars in fines. This way planes operates. It plays fast and loose when it comes to safety and now property owners, wildlife, the environment, and all those who enjoy the California's coastline are paying a very high price. Ocean and beachfront properties along California's Pacific Coast are highly desirable and valuable places to live. 
Capilo said in the statement. Property owners have enjoyed unspoiled sand and water and direct access to fishing, surfing, and other water sports. These waters are home to a wide variety of fish, birds, and aquatic mammals. All this is now damaged by the spill, and the damage and threat of additional spills will be likely last decades. The Santa Barbara County Health Department recommends that residents avoid the areas affected by the spill and not come in direct contact with oil or inhale the fumes, which can cause skin irritation, nausea, vomiting, and other illnesses. This can be difficult to do when you live next to the containment, contaminated ocean. This is according to Lawrence Conlin, a Capilo and Noel partner working on the case. The suit was filed in federal court for the Central District of California. The name plaintiff, a family trust, owns beachfront real property just north of Refugio State Beach along with the Santa Barbara County coast. Blaine does not comment on the suit, but stated on June 24th that cleanup costs from the spill have reached $92 million. A highly charged bill that would eliminate most exemptions that allow parents to avoid requirements to vaccinate their children easily cleared one of its last hurdles Thursday. Senate Bill 277, which mandates vaccinations for all school children, regardless of their parents' personal or religious beliefs, passed on a 46 to 30 vote in the state assembly. Only medical exemptions would be allowed. Controversy around the elimination of the personal belief exemption was spurred in California after a measles outbreak started last December at Disneyland. By the time they declared the outbreak over in mid-April, State health officials confirmed 136 measles cases in California. That's something that the bill's two authors, Senators Richard Pan, De Democrat Sacramento, and Ben Allen, Democrat Santa Monica, said could have been prevented if more Californians, particularly those in communities with low vaccination rates, were fully immunized. If enacted into law, California would join only two other states, Mississippi and West Virginia, that permit only medical exemptions has legitimate reasons to sidestep vaccinations. But over the past few months, hundreds of parents who oppose the legislation, legislation have rallied at the Capitol, saying the bill violates their parental rights. Other opponents believe that some vaccines are unsafe for children. They say testified at public hearings where the measure was being considered. Following Thursday's vote, they rallied again, and even though many opponents expected the Assembly to pass the bill, they said they were pleased with so many Democrats spoke publicly against it, proving the vaccination isn't a partisan issue. If Government Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown, signs the bill, said Michelle Triner, a mother of these three vaccinated children, she hopes he'll take steps to protect the relig religious exemption. Our country was founded on religious freedom, said Triner, who lives in Antioch. Although I don't have a religious objection to vaccinating my children, some people do, and their rights need to be protected. Because the bill was recently slightly amended in the Assembly, it must return to the Senate, its house of origin, for a final okay. After that, SB 277 would require Brown's signature to become law, the governor's staff had said Brown believes that vaccinations are profoundly important and a major public health benefit, and any bill that reaches his desk will be closely considered. When the Desert Sunlight Solar Plant opened in February, it was hailed as the world's largest solar project. Interior Secretary Sally Jewell was on hand to mark the momentous occasion, which she celebrated by flipping a giant ceremonial light switch. But Desert Sunlight's world record 550 megawatt, 3,800 acre solar field lasted less than six months. On the border of Los Angeles and Kern counties, the 579 megawatt Solar Star project is now open for business. According to data from the California Independent System Operator, Solar Star came fully online on June 19th. Solar Star is actually two projects owned by BHE Renewables and built by Sun Power Corporation. Southern California Edison is buying the power from the plants, which span more than 3,200 acres in the Antelope Valley, about two and a half hours northeast of Coachella Valley. Coachella. Coachella Valley. It's not new to California, folks. It is in one of the best festivals. Coachella. All three of the world's largest solar plants, Solar Star, Desert Sunlight, and the Topaz Project in San Luis Obispo County, are now located in California. It's an exciting time for renewable energy advocates California has already set 14 records for solar power generation this year and expects a Expert. steady clip. Expert. 
Experts expect a steady clip of new records over the summer, especially with SolarStar now fully online. California's rapid solar growth has been fueled by both falling costs and by the state's renewable energy mandate, which requires major utilities to buy 33% of their retail electricity from renewable sources by 2020. Based on contracts for clean energy projects that haven't yet come online, utilities have already have most of the electricity they'll need to hit their 2020 targets. Meanwhile, Governor Jerry Brown has called for California to get 50% of its electricity from renewables by 2030, and the state Senate passed legislation earlier this month that would make Brown's target state law. But it's all guaranteed that the same bill or a version of that bill will clear the Assembly as well. We'll be back in a few minutes with the rest of the regional news. We'll be right back. The tax man's taken all my dough and left me in my stately home, blazing on a sunny afternoon. And I can't sail my yacht. He's taken everything I got. All I've got this sunny afternoon. Manticorp Tax and Accounting can help you minimize taxation, establish a corporate presence, and save you money. Our over 25 years of experience in domestic and international taxation and incorporation services makes us the best at what we do. Your first consultation at Manticorp is always free, and our discounted rates guarantee you will not end up paying for what you don't get. Try Manticorp today. For more information, call 707-701-6416 or email info at manticorpusa.com. Welcome back. I'm Amanda Gonzalez. And the last time I checked, I'm Pete Schiffman. <laughs> Close to us, some news. The Willits Bypass Project is reporting that it expects to complete all bridges and viaducts by the end of this year. And, bearing unforeseen circumstances, the completion of all asphalt by the end of summer 2016. At the end of 2014, Caltrans announced that the project would be delayed until 2017. Due to delays in moving fill dirt to the project's north interchange, during the winter, Caltrans re-engineered the northern interchange to reduce its wetlands impact and also to allow the use of longer piles to allow the concrete bridge construction to proceed before the full 300-day settling period had elapsed. The project is now considered 70% complete. According to the project update, and contractors expect to complete the roadway from the southern end to the bridge work at the Northern Interchange. By the end of this year, this preliminary leaves the final right fill and paving at the Northern Interchange to compete. This area needs to settle over the 2015 and 2016 winter before it can be brought to final grade and paved. While the construction is proceeding ahead of schedule, the mitigation part of the project is just beginning. The Inland Empire is seeing steady growth in the Latino population, which now comprises half the region's resident census figures released Thursday's show. The region has also reported steady growth in the Asian population and a slight increase in African Americans, but it continues to lose whites. To Latino community organizers, the continuing growth in the Latino population is not surprising. The rise of Latinos is also linked to the number of distribution centers that move into the Inland Empire. Many of those centers bring their workers with them. It's living where you're able to find a job and pay rent. The population estimates also show a growing number of Asians in Riverside and San Bernardino counties and a drop in the white population, the latter a trend since 2010 in the San Bernardino County and 2012 in Riverside County. Riverside County's African American population increased by more than 1,800 residents while San Bernardino County saw an increase of 1134 African American residents. A contrast from the previous year's estimates when the African American population dropped in San Bernardino County. Raymond Turner, a pastor of Temple Missionary Baptist Church, a mostly African American congregation in San Bernardino, said many African Americans were leaving the San Bernardino area in search of cheaper housing, jobs, and lower crime. 
Many he said were moving to Las Vegas or Arizona. Turner said he couldn't account for the slight African-American growth noted in the census estimates, said he had heard from more African-Americans who are yearning to come back to California after moving. People who have moved away have expressed interest in coming back, he said. A lot of them are beginning to realize that a house is not a home, Turner added. The social aspect is what's missing the, the community. Now in local news, the identities of two men killed in a fairy Lake County Fire. crash, fiery Lake County crash, over the weekend are still undetermined. The two men were in a blue 2005 Toyota Scion traveling at a high rate of speed that went out of control and hit a tree early Saturday morning before bursting into flames. The vehicle was traveling westbound Morgan Valley Road, east of Bonham Road near Lower Lake, when it hit the tree around 2.30 a.m. and the CHP said fire personnel extinguished the flames. The California Grains is asking everyone to step over the line for seed freedom. At noon this Wednesday, July 1st, they'll step over that line in the parking lot of the Big Valley Grange at 1510 Big Valley Road in Finley. David Piotrowski and Robert, Roberta Actor Thomas, who live more than three miles apart, will exchange some seeds. Bring some of your seeds of your own and find a distant neighbor to exchange with. This will be a short, fun event, but it makes a serious point and one that potentially could affect anyone who saves heirloom seeds. Back in August of 2014, AB 2470 banned the exchange of seeds between people who live more than three miles apart. The current Secretary of Agriculture says she isn't going to enforce that provision against small farmers or gardeners, but no one knows how her successor will interpret or enforce the law. Similar language caused the shutdown of a seed exchange located in a public library in Pennsylvania when the state officials decided to crack down on seed savers. This means if you give someone who gardens more than three miles from where you saved your tomato seeds and they can give you some beans, you are breaking the law. Proponents of the event feel this language needs to be changed. They also feel portions of AB 2470 that ban neighbors from providing each other with seeds and prevent communities from regulating GE crops also need to be changed. At the request of the Lake County Board of Supervisors, also known as BOS, a proposed amendment to the Lake County Zoning Ordinance that would limit the age of manufactured homes that can be installed in the county came back to the Lake County Planning Commission Thursday to approve additional language that would allow the Community Development Department, CDD, to make exceptions under specific guidelines. Under the revised proposal, manufactured homes new to the county that are older than 10 years from the date of building permit applications are not allowed. However, if the manufactured home had been owned by the applicant for a minimum of two years, currently resides within a mobile home park within the county's jurisdiction and is being relocated to a parcel of land that was purchased by August 1st, an exception may be made. Additionally, the manufactured homes cannot be manufactured prior to July 1st, 1976 and must be able to be retrofitted to meet current fire codes. The county defines a manufactured home as a single family factory constructed housing unit built on or after June 15th, 1976. That is in compliance, compliance. That is in compliance with the standard of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development prom promulgated under the Federal National Manufactured Housing Construction and Safety Standards Act of 1974 does not include a recreational vehicle, park model RV, commercial coach or factory built housing defined by the California Health and Safety Code. Housing dubbed mobile homes fall within the manufactured home designation. Manufactured housing must also meet other standards established by the county for housing. The amendments to the proposal were approved by the Planning Commission by a vote of 3 to 0 with District 2nd Commissioner Bob Maley and District 3rd Commissioner Gladys Rosehill absent, it will now go back to the BOS for final approval. Let's go back to that prior story. How many people know that it's against the law to exchange seats? That's what I says. never knew that. This is the first day today. That's why Wednesday is so important for everybody. Monsanto strikes its lovely head exactly. again. Exactly. It was shame. designed by Monsanto. Yeah. 
When it comes time to vote, the three sitting members of the Lake County Planning Commission unhesitantly approved the final environmental impact report for the Valley Oaks development project. The half hour hearing largely revolved around questions from District 1 and Commissioner Chair Joseph Sullivan to Community Development Department Director Rick Coel. Sullivan voiced a concern over the status of other development projects in the Middletown area and the impact and approval of the Valley Oaks project would have on them. According to Coel, aside from a scant handful of projects that would require further revision before they could be considered, other projects have either exp expired or been abandoned by the developers and are no longer valid plans. Sullivan also asked Coel's opinion of the project. Coel stated the project would support activities that can't fit or are non-existent in Middlet Middletown. He mentioned that there is an intent by the developer Ken Porter and Kimco to pursue medical offices, a movie theater, and various shopping and restaurant options that might have trouble getting a foothold within Middletown proper. Coel added they do, not, they do expect to see further development within Middletown as the economy continues to recover. However, any such development would also require work to be done on the Middletown sewer system to cope with the increased load. He stated Porter would still have to receive permits for business developments within the Valley Oaks project, which would be addressed by the CDD and the Planning Commission at a relevant future time. Sullivan's final question addressed concerns over funding for emergency services, specifically fire-related. Porter volunteered he has had multiple meetings with fire departments in Cal Fire, and there is an agreement in place to provide an additional $75,000 to $80,000 per year to the fire district to cover the cost of the development's emergency services needs. It was also stated by Coel that the CDD had received confirmation that the development had the right to and could take advantage of riparian water rights and there was no water issues. Only two members of the public, Larry and Lorreen Chandler of Hidden Valley Lake, appeared at the hearing to voice concerns over the project. The commission voted 3-0 to zero in favor of the FEIR and associated plans, with commissioners Gladys Rosehill and Bob Malley absent. The project next goes to the Board of Supervisors for consideration and final approval. The Meals on Wheels thrift store of Clear Lake is celebrating its one-year anniversary on Thursday and Friday. Activities include a raffle and a store-wide special of 50% off red-tagged items. Deals will be on housewares, clothing, toys, and more. Sales and support programs at the Highland Senior Service Center. The Meals on Wheels Thrift Store of Clear Lake is located at 13773 Lakeshore Drive in Clear Lake. For more information, call the Meals on Wheels Thrift Store at 707-994-9194. The Lake County Democratic Central Committee will hold its regular meeting, monthly meeting on Thursday, the Lower Lake Methodist Church Community Meeting Room located at 16255 2nd Street in Lower Lake at 6.30 p.m. The agenda for the meeting includes reports from representatives for Mike Thompson and John Garamendi, Assemblyman Bill Dodd and State Senator Mike McGuire, as well as reports from the representatives from the Stonewall Democratic Club and the Lake County Democratic Club. Democrats will be running an information voter registration booth on July 4th at Austin Park in the city of Clear Lake. To get involved, come to the meeting and the committee will find a way for you to participate. Meetings are open to the public and can, committee membership is open to all registered Democrats. For information about the Democratic Party in Lake County, visit www.lakecountydemocrats.org or contact them at 533-4885 or by email at democratsoflakecounty at gmail.com. Now with the weather, today will, be ha today will have plentiful sunshine with a high on 98 degrees. Winds are from the southwest side at 10 to 15 miles an hour. Tonight it will be generally clear with a low of 76. 70, 67. 67. <laughs> Wrong one. Yeah. Winds will still, winds will still be out of the south, southwest at 10 to 15 miles an hour. Tuesday, it will be hotter with a high of 104. We will see a few clouds from time to time, winds shifting to the southeast direction, south remaining south-southeast, south, remaining at the 10 to 15 miles an hour. In the evening, it will be clear with a low of 72 degrees, winds shifting to the south-southwest, 
at 10 to 15 miles an hour. When we join you on Wednesday, we will see temperatures get even hotter, bringing us mainly sunny sky with a high of 106 degrees, definitely lake weather. Winds with south-southwest at 10 to 20 miles an hour. Unfortunately, no rain in the forecast. I think I need to move back to Phoenix where it's cooler. <laughs> it's ridiculous 105 degrees in Lake County. Oh, in sports, it was the biggest crowd at Sonoma Raceway in a decade. Fans streaming into the 1.99 mile road course in Caneros on Sunday to pay their last respects to Jeff Gordon. He didn't die, did he? The legendary driver who grew up down Highway 37 Vallejo and has announced his impending retirement. The fans of the number 24 car left disappointed as Gordon finished 16th, well back in the pack. But they got just about everything else a race fan could crave. Dazzling weather, eye-catching but injury-free wrecks, daring passes, and even sibling rivalry. Kyle Busch outlasted his older brother Kurt to win here for the second time. Kyle has won in 2008, <coughs> excuse me, so the raceway streak of 10 different winners in 10 years was snapped. Sacramento hosted the U.S. Senior Open this weekend. Jeff Maggart, who is moving into an elite class on golf senior circuit, won the U.S. Senior Open on Sunday for a second major victory on the Champions Tour this year. He closed with a 565 at sun-drenched El Paso Country Club, edging defending champion Colin Montgomery by two strokes. The victory makes Maggart more than merely a repeat winner on the 15-over tour. Along with Montgomery and Bernard Langer, the three have combined to win the past eight majors. Maggart made six birdies and one bogey to finish at 10-under 270. He took home $675,000, a gold medal, a silver trophy, an exemption into next year's U.S. Open at Oakmont. On Sunday, Madison Bumgarner literally changed his tune. He discarded Fire on the Mountain, his traditional warm-up song, for Bad Company by Five Finger Death Punch. Good song. The insistent change of luck was not behind that decision after three stars without run support. I just wanted to hear something else, he said. But the effect was the same. Bum Garner had a good day on the mound, holding Colorado to two runs in seven and two-thirds innings and at the plate. He had his eighth career home run and scored twice, although Buster Posey and Matt Duffy were the real story offensively. Posey drove in three runs with two singles, and Duffy completed a 10-for-25 homestand by collecting three legs of the cycle for the second consecutive game, this time needing only a single in his final at bat. No giant has hit for a cycle at China Basin, which has hosted only one, by Oakland's Eric Burns in 2003. Bumgarner allowed a two-run first-inning homer to Nolan Arendo. He hit four in the series, including a ninth-inning solo against Sergio Romo. But after Arnado sent Bumgarner's curveball into the left-field seats, the Rockies went three for 23 with two walks, two double plays, and eight strikeouts against the lefty. Four was pulled in the eighth. His second-inning strikeout to Brandon Barnes with the thousands of his career at 25, making him the youngest San Francisco pitcher to achieve that milestone. He surpassed buddy Matt Kane, who was 26 when he did it. The Giants now have won two in a row in seven out of his last ten, finding themselves one game behind the Dodgers once again. The A's lost their third in a row to the Kansas City Royals after a five-game winning streak. For the Royals, Guthrie struck out a season-high seven batters to top a thousand strikeouts for his career, and Perez homered for his 500th career hit to help Kansas City complete a three-game sweep of the Oakland Athletics with a 5-3 victory on Sunday. Omar Infante hit a tie-breaking single in a three-run six inning for the Royals, who had won 5-6 to open a nine-game road trip. Guthrie allowed two runs in six innings and reached 1,005 career strikeouts in his 12th Major League season. Jesse Chavez, 4-7, was hurt by an error by third baseman Max Muncy in Kansas City's three-run six inning. Billy Burns helped spark a two-run third inning for Oakland when he led off with a single to extend his hitting streak to 16 straight games. The A's find themselves 10 games out of first place. Up next for Oakland is a three-game series against the Colorado Rockies. Now with our final word, a strange little story, an incident that started with a pajama-clad woman tapping on a restaurant window in Monroe, Texas, and got weirder from there, ended with a local woman hospitalized, police said. 
Audra Smith, 47, was arrest on a, re arrested on a warrant Thursday in connection with a June 6th incident at Tula's restaurant. Smith, wearing a hooded sweatshirt and pajama bottoms, tapped on the restaurant's front window to get the attention of customers seated inside of a window table. Smith then entered the restaurant and sat at their table and began to drink wine from one of their glasses. She asked the patrons to call 911, patrons stand, to call 911, stating that they would know why. The, patri the patron got up to call the manager and Smith stood up, began to walk out of the restaurant, picked up a wine glass from the table and threw it at the wall, causing it to shatter. The police spokesman said, but their evening wasn't over. The suspect then walked out of the restaurant, knocked over two planters, and began to walk down the middle of the Route 25. According to the police report, she then re-entered the restaurant and locked herself into the ladies' restroom. An officer was able to coax Smith to leave the restaurant, and once outside, she told the officer that she had a medical condition. The police spokesman said emergency medical personnel determined that her behavior was not due to a medical condition. He said Smith was transported to the hospital as a repercussion. As a precaution. As a precaution. I just hope she had a good glass of wine, though, and enjoyed herself. Sounds like she did. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you for watching News at Noon with LCM TV. We'll be back, uh, our, excuse me, our next live show will be this afternoon at 3 o'clock with a positive light. We'll be back on Wednesday with LCM Talk Show, and we'll have, hopefully, Bill Dodd as our guest. Thank you for staying in tune. Well, our next news broadcast is Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Have a good week in the meantime. I'm Pete Schiffman. And I'm Amanda Gonzalez. Have a good day. Are you Michael?